research in Nigeria for his Yale PhD thesis, Weba co-founded AFRIONE, the first ISP in North Central Nigeria. He has served on a variety of corporate and public sector boards across Africa and is also a widely published author and speaker. His most recent book, A Story of Heroes Plus Epics, The History of Football in Nigeria, published by Bookcraft in 2018. Dr. Boa earned a PhD and two master's degrees from Yale University and a bachelor's degree from Calvin College, all in history. He spent one year studying political science at the University of Jos and completed his primary and secondary education at Hillcrest School, also in Jos, Nigeria, where he was born and raised. So thank you very much for, for accepting our invitation, sir. You are very welcome, Dr. Weba. Is your camera on? Yes, it is. Yep, it's on. You're very, very welcome. Great. All right, so, thank you for having me on. Dr. Weba. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you for honoring this invitation. I'm gonna dive right in with our questions because we have so much to get through and, and I know that the panelists are probably itching to hear the responses to some of the questions they submitted. So I'd just like you to give us a brief background, a history of who you are and your career journey. How did you find yourself where you are right now? All right, thank you very much. Um, I see some of the people who are on this are actually people who've known me since childhood. So I actually have to now <laughs> change everything I was gonna say because they can actually correct me. So no, I'm kidding. Um, so listen, I was <laughs> born and raised in Joss, Nigeria, the best place on earth. Um, I went to Hillcrest School, which wow. is an American international school in Joss. Um, and then I went to, um, I went there from all the way from grade one through grade 12, all the way uh, primary, secondary. Um, then went to Calvin College in Michigan for my undergrad and then Yale University for my PhD. Um, but along the way, uh, at the age of 16, um, I had fulfilled all of the requirements to now naturalize as a Nigerian. Um, and, and I actually went to, to apply for my naturalization and I was denied. Um, and so that was actually a life changing moment for me because all my life I thought I was Nigerian. And then I was now denied that I was not Nigerian. So one of the reasons I actually did a PhD in African history was I wanted to out Nigeria everybody. I wanted to know more about Nigeria and Nigerian history than anybody else. Um, and so that was one of the reasons I did that. Um, but, but the other reason was that, um, you know, I was a missionary kid from the middle of Nigeria. I didn't have a network, I didn't have connections. And I knew that going to a university like Yale would actually open doors. Um, and so that was actually the primary reason. I, I never really planned to be a, um, a university lecturer. Um, and so straight out of Yale, uh, once I finished my, actually while at Yale, as, as the profile says, I actually started a business in Joss. Um, then straight out of Yale, I went to work for World Vision Mauritania um, in, in, in basically the middle of the Sahara Desert uh, to run a US government funded program there. And it was very much focused on impact. We were impacting very poor people, but there was no strategy around it. And it was very, um, it was a lot, it, you know, it was a, a lot of funding, but there wasn't really a well thought out plan. It wasn't well, you know, it wasn't well structured and so on. And I realized that um, if I was gonna create impact in my career, I needed to now also learn how to be strategic, how to learn how to be a manager and that kind of thing. So having already had a PhD, I did not want to now go and back to school and get an MBA. Um, and so I actually went to McKinsey so that I could basically get a MBA on the job. Um, so I went to uh, McKinsey. I spent um, several years in McKinsey based in Atlanta, um, working with very traditional American companies like Coca-Cola, um, Georgia Pacific, um, AT&T, places like that. Um, and then after that, finally got the opportunity in McKinsey to now go to Kenya uh, and basically do the 25 year national development strategy for the government of Kenya. And that was a phenomenal opportunity. Um, after that, I then did an agriculture related project for McKinsey in East Africa. And one of the clients on that was the Rockefeller Foundation um, who then basically said, hey, Weba, um, do you really wanna go back to Atlanta? Why don't you come join us and, and basically relaunch the Africa office in Nairobi. So I made the jump uh, from McKinsey to Rockefeller uh, and, and spent you know, three more amazing years in Kenya. Um, and, and it really was, even though Rockefeller was a century old, we were really like relaunching the Africa program. Um, and so that was very, very, you know, an exciting opportunity, um, obviously with a lot of impact and all that. But then I got a call um, unexpectedly uh, from Lagos uh, that the Tony Alumalu Foundation was looking for a CEO and they saw my profile and they wanted me to come and interview with them. Um, 
in, in my life, I never wanted to live in Lagos. Um, anyone who's grown up in the North, especially when we did, um, all of Southern Nigeria was seen as a basket case of, um, you know, it was insecure, it was dangerous. You know, we would get certain, you know, kidnapped, beaten, killed, whatever. Um, I, so I never even set foot in Lagos, even though I lived in Nigeria all my life until the age of 16. So the idea of actually coming and living in Lagos was something I had never thought of. Um, but, you know, it was an exciting opportunity. Um, it was, it was um, some, you know, opportunity to start something new, you know, build a, a, one of the first sort of institutional African philanthropies. Um, and so I took the plunge and came over. Um, after five years there, then I moved to um, the Boston Consulting Group again to start up their operation in West Africa. And then while there, I got this call um, again out of the blue from Shell to say, hey, you want to come and run this fund? Uh, and, and I actually at first thought the, the person who sent the email was joking because it just sounded too good to be true. Um, and, and now I have, I think, probably the best job in Nigeria. Wow. I think one of the most interesting things you mentioned just now is just the different perceptions of um, different parts of the same country by um, you know, northerners and southerners, southerners and northerners, but you have quite an incredible um, background and diversity in your experiences and, and your leadership position. So, I mean, thank you for being so willing to share, to share your experiences with us. So what would you say would be or was the best decision you've made con consciously or unconsciously? Because it seemed like so many events in your life were almost serendipitous. So what would you say has been the best decision you've made? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, it, you're right. I mean, a lot of opportunities came to me without me looking for them. Um, and so I would say it's, it's the willingness to leave uh, a very comfortable situation to go to something new and, and un, uncertain. Um, and so I did that with World Vision, I did that with Rockefeller, and then I did that with BCG. And um, every time it turned out to be, for the most part, the right decision. Wow, okay. So that's also risk-taking. I mean, that, which brings me to my next question. What would you say is the biggest um, factor that has helped you to be successful? Although I don't wanna answer the question for you, but it appears you, know, you seem to be someone who's willing to um, take the risk no matter what it uh, what it looks like but you can answer what would you say is your um yes the decision so or say, the factor that yeah. helps you be yeah. successful yeah so i would say it's um yeah partly obviously being willing to take risks um but i, I think more importantly um it's the to so uh, you know when i move from one thing to the next um it's total and complete commitment to whatever organization mm. or particular field that i'm now in um and i you know dig deep and i go deep very quickly so you know, for example, one week into running the agriculture strategy for the government of Kenya uh, 2000, in 2007 with, with no prior agriculture experience, um, the permanent secretary of agriculture was asking me where I got my ag economics PhD from. Um, you know, same, same wow. thing now with, within the energy space. Before I joined All On, um, I never did anything in energy. Um, and, and, you know, you just come in and you absorb and you learn um, and then you have to be really focused and passionate about that sector, um, you know, and, and mm. so I think that's been what has made it successful is that I can go from one place to the next um, and, 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 and adapt and then, um, and then really dig into that particular sector. So aside from being, you know, committed and giving everything your all, every opportunity that comes to you, um, working with, you know, diligence and mm -hmm. um, I guess dedication, what would you say have been your success habits? And I say this because a lot of times we attend motivational speaker um, speeches and, mm -hmm. and we hear speakers say, well, I read, you know, a thousand books in a month and I wake up every morning at 3 a.m. and I start my day. So what would you say your success habits are? Okay. Yeah. So it's, no, it's nothing like that. Um, so the, the one is um, total integrity. Um, and integrity is, is, is partly the honesty. That's part of it, but also just a following through on commitments. Um, you know, you, you mm. can be a great leader, but if, 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 you know, you, like you say, you're going to come and do this event and then, oh, sorry, I'm too busy. I can't do it. That's a lack of integrity. Right. So totally yeah. saying, if I, if yeah. I commit to something, I will do it. Um, the other is, is um, I've always been innovative. Um, I've always pushed the envelope. Um, the, you know, when I was in the Rockefeller foundation, for example, the, the, the legal team there, because of how I was trying to stretch the limits of what was legal when it came to grant making in Rockefeller, 
you know, they, they, they were joking that they basically half their time was spent protecting the foundation from my crazy ideas. I took that as a compliment, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and I think with Shell, it's probably the same thing right now. Um, so, so that's one is just being innovative and always pushing, you know, always pushing, especially when you feel very comfortable. That's the time when you need to actually keep, you know, push more because it means mm. that you're, you maybe start being complacent. Um, the other one is being responsive. Um, another thing you find from people as they go up the chain is they get less and less responsive and less and less, it's less and less able to reach them and, and get them to, 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 to listen or to, you know, and, and I, I, for me, it's like, look, it doesn't matter who it is that's that that needs a response from me. It is it is um, it is just courteous to say, even if it's sorry, I don't have a job for you. Thanks for sharing your your resume. At least give them attention. And um, I think that's something that people lose as they get more senior and they feel like, oh, you know, I don't have to. I can just ignore people. But some of those people may one day be senior to you, so you don't know. Um, and then the other mm. is identifying and building really good people. Um, and, and I think that the, my biggest joy actually as a, as a boss, as a leader, as a CEO has been the people that I brought in, um, sometimes just as interns who then became, you know, very successful and, and did really well after, um, either with me or in another organization. And, and that's always made me the most proud. Hmm. Thank you for that. And I think to be, well, to be quite frank, that was the whole, reason behind this series, the fact that the higher leaders go or the higher individuals go, the less responsive they become, the less accessible they become. Mm -hmm. And obviously you growing up in Nigeria, you're very familiar with this uh, cultural hierarchy. I don't even know if it's cultural. Yeah, this hierarchy that we have that, uh, you know, the higher you go up, the less and less reachable and accessible you are. And I think you, I mean, you made a really important point and um, it's so powerful and valuable that you invest in humans, you, you, take human development, human capital development seriously, the people that you work with that work around you. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's it's all adding value, right? So if you're investing in the people, even if it's an intern or uh, trainee or NYSE or whatever, you can promote them and obviously they can add more value um, to your company or your organization. So a less serious question, how Mm -hmm. do you relax in your free time? Um, I don't have free time. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so I know I, I do actually a lot of things. Um, first, I play drums. I'm a drummer. Um, so I'm oh, actually cool. by, in, in my heart, I'm a musician. I, all of this other stuff is just, you know, to, 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 to make a living. But at my heart, if I could, I would be a drummer in a Congolese Makosa band. That would be my, my, my life stream. Um, so, so um, amazing. A, a, as you can see, I fit the profile. Um, I also, I, I write books, I read, um, <laughs> I, uh, I used to be a long distance runner, but my knees went out, they're busted. So now I just have to do long walks like an old person. Um, I play football when I can, uh, with my sons. Um, and then I'm an obsessed football fan. Um, and the super Eagles, by the way, are playing in about an hour. So we definitely can't go over, um, because I, I would <laughs> no, actually stop. I would stop in the middle of a sentence if the game starts, um, and then finally, uh, I have a goal to go to to visit every country in the world before I die. Um, unfortunately, every year there's like one or two new countries or entities that are considered con- countries. Um, so so I, I, yeah. I have about 100, 140 <laughs> left to go. So I, I have 140 left to go, but I'm, I'm getting there. So, yeah. Wow. So honestly, I can't let that question go by without asking follow-up mm-hmm. questions. Okay. Yeah. So first being... I, there were so many that, as you were talking, that were coming up. I wanted to confirm, you know, your favorite band. You said Con- Congolese Makosa, so I'm wondering, <laughs> your favorite band. If you're a musician, you're a drummer, you must have favorite band, favorite genre of music. Um, right. I was going to ask what your football team is, but you've already mentioned Super Eagles. So let's let's hear some details. You, you have to okay. you have well, to I'll, be specific. Okay, I'll start with. Um, actually, I'll go backwards. So I will. My my favorite national team is the Super Eagles, obviously. Favorite club team is Plateau United and Arsenal. Um, then favorite um, favorite band. So I, I, it depends on the genre. So rock and roll, it's U2. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, oh. um, a lot of, I, I, I self-taught drumming myself. And a lot of what I, how I learned how to drum was by listening to um, Larry Mullen Jr. from U2. Um, and then music, I mean, yeah. So um, my favorite Congolese band is Kondabongo Man. Um, you know, oh I, I, my you, you, you may have never even heard of him. Um, no, I then, grew up. 
I grew up on Gondor Bungleman. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And then, um, and so, well, if you know him, let, you know, put in a good word for me. Um, and then um, <laughs> in, in terms of Nigerian music, um, look, I, I, obviously everyone loves Fela. I mean, you, you can't, you can't not love Fela, but then I think of the sort of, let's say musicians in the last 10 years, um, it has to be um, M.I. and Jesse Jags. Um, and there's a personal reason for that, but uh, you know, I, no one else can touch them. So, mm. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> the, the, anything, any, anything Kevin Ray writes, just ignore it, please. <laughs> okay. Not he's, a he's one of my, he's one of my big brothers. He's actually just here to, um, to, to rattle me, I think. So. Okay. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you've worked in different countries. Yeah. You've been exposed mm -hmm. to different cultures and you travel a lot and you plan to travel even more. How do you easily adapt in new terrains? Yeah, so um, I, I, as you know, I grew up in Joss, um, but I grew up in a very international community in Joss. My parents were foreign missionaries. The school we went to was an international school. Um, so from a young age, you know, we were interacting with people from every nationality, every ethnic group in Nigeria, every religion, you know, it was very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the upbringing, um, there's a thing called a third culture kid. It's a concept of yep. those of us, I'm sure lots of people in the Shapers know what this is, but it's people who basically, you know, your parents are diplomats, business people, military, missionaries, many, many things. Mm -hmm. And you grow up in a country in which you do not have a passport, um, but you are not there as an immigrant or as a refugee. You're not there permanently. And so there's this other country or countries for which you have passports that is supposed to be your home, but you don't recognize as home. And then there's this country or countries you grow up in that you feel at home in, but doesn't legally recognize you. So that's a third culture yeah. kit. Um, and so we create this blended culture between all the different influences we have. And people who grow up like that, um, you end up very easily adapting from one place to the other. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've worked in the US, I've worked in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, it, working for a Christian organization in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, um, worked for world, I mean, worked in Kenya and then in Nigeria. And so obviously every place you know, the work culture is different, even every organization and sector, the culture is different. Um, but I think it's that, that sort of third culture kid upbringing that allows me to move from one to the next um, and, and, and fit in quite easily. It also makes it easy to forget where you just came from and, and, and not be too attached, um, which it may be the downside of it. But the upside is that you can very easily adapt and move on. This is um, an interesting follow-up question because I, I can relate to a bit of what you said um, in terms of you know growing up in different um, areas. And I, I just thought of a friend of mine who was born in Saudi Arabia but is not you know legally recognized as mm -hmm. uh, Saudi. Um, family, parents originally from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. So, would you say that you've ever experienced an identity crisis of any? <laughs> Um, Why are you laughing? Every, every day, every day, when I look in the mirror and I realize I'm not Nigerian. No, um, no, you no, are Nigerian. Actually, actually, no. It really was. It was at the age of 16 when I went to that immigration office and got laughed at. Um, was probably like a big. Yeah, that was probably the biggest identity crisis I had. Where I was like, "What do you mean I can't be Nigerian? I am Nigerian." And and they just laughed yeah. at me. So that was probably the the the, the biggest single moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, because, uh, you know, my, my wife is Trinidadian um, of Chinese, Indian, African and European descent. So like, all you know, mixed like that. Um, so that's another sort of layer of identity. And then my children have four passports. Um, one of them was also born in Kenya. So like there's all of these different mm -hmm. influences. Um, and, and so, yeah, sometimes, you know, and my wife probably reminds me of this the most. She's like, you can't claim every identity. You have to pick mm -hmm. one. Um, I like to be inclusive, but yeah, it, it is sometimes, <laughs> you know, hard to say, wait, where am I? What? So when someone asks you the question, where are you from? Um, you know, they're a third culture kid when it takes a while for them to figure out how to answer. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Totally get that. Totally get that. Hmm. So would you say that being born and growing up in Nigeria has contributed to your career choices? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so look, I, I grew up... Um, you know, my, my, my parents were missionaries, um, but my father was very focused on social issues and poverty alleviation, not just saving souls. Um, and and mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, they very consciously made sure we didn't grow up in that expatriate bubble that many third culture kids do grow yeah. up in. Yeah. Um, so we weren't shielded from like the realities of poverty in Nigeria and, and what 
what that really meant. Um, and so it's always made me focus in my career on impact before money. Um, and, and so I've walked away from big opportunities because it was like, okay, that's not gonna um, create impact and, and, and make lives better for poor Nigerians or poor Africans. Um, so there's that, but then there's also, look, I mean, I, I had such a magical upbringing in Nigeria. I love this country. Um, you know, also Kenya was amazing to live in. Mauritania, uh, tough place, but again, just charming in its own way. Um, and, and I just love the continent. And so I think part of that is what makes me, you know, if there's a great role that's in Africa or a great role that's somewhere else, I would always take the one in Africa. Um, some people have sort of accused me of monetizing my upbringing. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's that. I, just, I think it's actually, look, I'm taking advantage of the lovely experiences I've had and then Absolutely. giving back. So, yeah. Absolutely. Another off-the-cuff question. Yeah. Now that you've spent quite a bit of time in Lagos, are you still yeah. as uh, um, loyal to Joss as you were back then, or are you a Lagosian? <laughs> no, well, no, I, I, I don't. Look, I mean, I've been in Lagos. I've been living in Lagos for a decade now. Um, so after Joss, it's the place I've lived in the longest in my life. Um, I still feel when I come in and out of Lagos, I like it, but I, I and I, it's actually grown on me. I'm, I'm now kind of like a salesman for Lagos, but Joss is always home. Um, you know, I, I have farmland in Joss and all that. And, and that's where, you know, if I was going to retire in Nigeria, that's where I would go. I, I, so, so Lagos, look, it has, a, it has a, a, bu- a hustle and a bustle that you just can't match. Um, Joss is a very sleepy town, um, but it's just, it's, it, you know, it's still home. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do like Lagos I, and and um, am, am very happy to, you know, promote it. And when people come, show them around, show them that it's not the scary place they think yeah. uh, and all that. Yeah. I'm so grateful to hear that. Um, there was a tourism project that um, I used to work with. And I remember basically learning that so many people come to Lagos, they stay in their hotel, they have mm-hmm. their meetings in their hotel, they have their conferences in their hotel mm-hmm. and they go back to the airport. So their yeah. Lagos experience is airport, hotel, airport. So yeah. it, it's yeah. honestly, we need voices like yours to sort of be our ambassadors and say, you know, go out, immerse yourself in the culture, learn about, you know, this country and, and this state in particular. And um, I appreciate on behalf of the Lagos Hub, <laughs> I appreciate you for, <laughs> for right. encouraging people. So just a couple of questions on leadership. Mm-hmm. Can you name a person who has had a tremendous impact on you as a leader? Um, it could have been a mentor, it could have been a family mm-hmm. member, a friend. Mm-hmm. just anyone yeah so it's it's actually um I'm, I'm not someone who has like a long time life mentor um it's more like people who've had particular influences at different points in my life mm-hmm. um and, and so you know one obviously as i said is my my father i mean a lot of what i do now is is because of the way he raised me um there's a um a, a person named ambassador alex lascaris uh, he's from the u.s foreign service and I met him, I was, he was a friend of my brother, my older brothers in, in Botswana as a young diplomat at the time. Um, and he's always been like a person that I could um, ask, you know, because he had no personal stake necessarily in what my decision was going to be. Um, mm-hmm. He was actually, he, he should, he was actually offered to be the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria this time around, but he turned it down and I'm still angry about that. But, but, um, but again, he's a great person who's always been an amazing sounding board. Um, another was Professor Lamin Sane. Um, Professor Sane was my academic advisor at Yale, who's from Gambia, from the Gambia. Um, and and he, um, he really helped shape my academic career and thinking, but also really um, encouraged me to think beyond academia because he, he knew my personality wasn't suited for it. Um, so, so that was great. Then there's someone named Acha Leke, who is like the, everyone knows Acha. He, he's from, you know, basically built McKinsey in Africa. Um, so he's the one who encouraged me to go to McKinsey and then brought me to Kenya to do that project, which, you know, eventually got me into Rockefeller and all that. Um, there's also Henrik Skovby, who was the founder of Dahlberg, um, the consulting firm Dahlberg. Um, yeah. He tried to recruit me many times. Um, I ended up never working directly with him. But we, you know, again, he's someone that when I need that kind of advice, I, I go to him. Um, also, Akin Adeshina, uh, who's the, the president of the African Development Bank. Um, we were actually colleagues at Rockefeller Foundation um, uh, in Nairobi. Um, and, and so he was, had been there a long time when I came in. So he was sort of the, like the, the mentor to me there. Um, and actually when I got the offer to come to Nigeria, um, he's the one who said, you know, take it. Like, it's exciting, go do it. Like staying in Rockefeller too long will get boring for you. So, so that was him. And then 
Um, currently, um, my boss in Shell, Osaki Okumbo, he's the country chair of Shell in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And he's just, he's been amazing in terms of, you know, Shell is a massive global company, massive company in Nigeria, very tight knit. Most people have been there 20, 30 years. So coming in from the outside was pretty tough. Um, and, and Osagi is always just a really helpful person to me. Um, and he takes like a personal interest. It's not just, you know, um, as a, as a, as an employer, but also kind of more as a, almost a friend um, to make sure that I, 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 I navigate the shell world the best way possible. Hmm. That's quite a number of people. And I yeah. think that's really, yeah. that's amazing to have that number, yeah. that many people, you know, be so instrumental and, uh, investing in you and encouraging you um, along different phases or seasons of your life. So what I've noted so far from this conversation in terms of, of um, characteristics that a leader should have, at least you know, based on your experiences, I know you've mentioned integrity, which is very vital. And then you've also mentioned just a willingness to, to do well, you know, to be diligent in your work and to do everything with excellence. You know? And then also I, 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 it appears mentorship or mm -hmm. yeah I think ultimately mentorship so what else would you mm -hmm. say is a character apart from those um, a characteristic that a leader should have yeah and this is probably the hardest one for a leader um, especially the more senior you get and that's humility um, mm -hmm. and you know it's again especially probably in the Nigerian context is, is, is one where it's particularly difficult um, because there is this sort of psychophancy that comes along um, and, and you have to always remain grounded and always remain humble and realize like, you know, I, I, I could be on the other side of this very quickly. Um, so I think humility yeah. is, is a very fundamental one and a, but a very difficult one. Hmm. Why do you think it's so difficult? Um, it's just, it goes against human nature, I think, you know, um, and, and, and all that. And, and when, when you, yeah, I think it just goes against human nature. And they say pride goes before the fall. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> humble yourselves. Yep. Okay. So what are a few resources you would recommend to someone looking to gain mm -hmm. insight into becoming a better leader? So I, I know there's, there's, you know, there's shelves and shelves of books on this and it's, it's a, it's a whole genre of its own, but I actually think it's all like it's self-taught and you have to learn it as you go. I, I don't think, I think it's a personal journey. Um, I think people who think you can study or read your way to being a, a, a good leader is, is they're wrong. Um, and, and I, so I've, I've never read a book on leadership and I never will. Um, mm, I guess, wow. uh, I guess, I guess other than the Bible, other than the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite uh, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I just, I, I think it's something that you, you either are, or you aren't, and then you, everyone, you have your own style and, and you need to go with that. Mm, wow wow it's and also you mentioned responsiveness qualities yes. for a leader in yeah. case anyone's taking notes so yeah. okay i'm going to move on to questions from the registrants they submitted mm -hmm. these questions while they were registering so i think we might have already answered a couple of them most significant decision um can you name a book that has transformed your life did we talk about books no i don't think we did no. okay can you name a okay. book that has transformed your life okay so with everything else, I, I, I can't answer with just one. Um, so there, there's, I would say there's three, three books. Uh, again, other than the Yeah, they're taking notes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so, some of my, my missionary kid friends are on, so I have to keep saying that. Anyway, um, so no, look, the, the first one is actually a book called Translating the Message by Lamin Sani, um, my academic advisor from Yale. Um, and and it, was a, um, it was a book where he basically put Christianity and missions and history and uh, in, in uh, Christianity and missions in the history of Africa in a very different way in a different context. And it actually helped me the way I positioned my own upbringing and where it fit in the, you know, there's a lot of negativity about like the impact of missionaries. Um, and, and this book, you know, written by a, the top African scholar on African religion, um, gave a very different look at it. And, and it, it, mm. it kind of changed my thinking and it was, it was actually very refreshing. Um, another one is a book called Poor Economics uh, by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. They're from MIT. And it was a book where they basically, they've done these long-term studies on all these sort of development projects around the world and showed how, you know, you can spend millions and millions and billions of dollars on economic development projects. But ultimately, if they don't create jobs and if there isn't like a commercial end to it at some point, it actually has no impact. 
Um, and, and so, so this book sort of validated what I had been seeing in my own work in, in economic development, but, um, but it was just, it was written in such a great way that, you know, it, 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 um, it taught a lot. They actually eventually won a Nobel prize actually for that work. Oh, wow. Um, for, for, for their body of work on, on economics, um, of, of sort of economics of poverty and all that. Um, and then a more recent one is, um, Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Um, you know, it, we're, we're in a world now where people throw facts or fake facts all over the place and you actually don't know what to believe now. Um, and that book was really very just down to earth. Okay, let's look at some of the, the sort of big um, accepted um, facts that we know around the world. And then let's actually see what, what, what the reality is. And it, it just shows how, how wrong we are on so many things. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and, and it just really helped because I think even in, in the work that I do now, you know, we're trying to light up 120 million, we're trying to provide power to 120 million Nigerians. I mean, that's a phenomenal, that's a huge target, yeah. a huge goal. Um, but within that, you know, then, you know, you always have to break it down and see, okay, is that, is it, is the number really that high? Is it, you know, and, and this, that book kind of pushes you to think deeper and not just accept everything you're your, um, you hear. Mm. Um, and and it, it, so it was also written in just a very straightforward, very easy to, to read manner. So again, another book I highly recommend. Yeah, that sounds like a very relevant book for the times that we're yeah. in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I like this next question. Okay, what's your go-to approach for motivating your team as a leader? Yeah. A lot of people yeah. here, they kind of govern with fear. So how do you yeah. motivate people? No, you know, it needs to be exactly the opposite of that. Um, I, I was in an environment where um, no, n nobody was, it was able to make decisions except the, the leader. Um, and, and actually, it was why I had to leave the place, because if you don't make decisions, you don't grow. Um, and so I, um, I like to, you know, my, 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 whether it's my leadership team or, you know, down a layer or two, um, you know, you make the decision. You tell me, what do you think is the right answer? Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and make people get used to doing that. And then they actually become themselves much better leaders. And you, as the leader, um, feel increasingly confident that, you know, they're probably going to be right. So let's, let's go with it. And, um, and so that's one, it's about letting people make decisions. Um, yeah. and then making sure that everybody gets the limelight, um, mm -hmm. in, a um, it, it's very easy in an, so like in, in my organization, okay, so I'm the CEO. So it's very easy for people to associate all on with me. Um, and so, um, you know, as much as possible where there's platforms and so on, I, I, I stay away from it and let my other team leaders or other people on my team do it so that it's not just me that's seen. Um, yeah. So that there are people out there who, when they think of all on, they think of Afolabi, my investment manager, where they think of Jade from the policy and partnerships team, because they've actually never it's them that they've engaged with. They've seen them in platforms and all that, and they've heard them on panels. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the all on they know. So it creates a mm. sense of both for the employee, like ownership, but also for the external yes. world that it's, it's not the institution and the individual is not the same. Um, yeah. that, then another is push people harder than they think they can go. Um, there are times I think when I went too hard on that. Um, but I, I think I've, I've learned better how to, balance it. Um, but I think m a lot of people don't realize how much better they are than they think they are. Um, and so try and push them as hard as possible. Mm. Um, and then also, um, you got to celebrate them, you know, because it's very easy as a, as a leader to always call out people when they make mistakes, yeah. um, blame them, and all that. But I think it's actually more powerful if you celebrate them when they do something really good, or, or yeah. some, they do something right. And you'd be surprised how, how fewer mistakes they make. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah I think that's you've made some really really important points um I I 100% agree with that when you kind of distribute ownership um people now have more of an incentive or more of a reason to to be excellent if your name is on it mm -hmm. if your face is there if you have time in the limelight then mm -hmm. you know you're more encouraged to rise to the occasion because now you have a you have a, a reason to, or even more of a reason to. And I, I've noticed working in different environments in, in Nigeria, that there's a disconnect between the work and then the employee. They're just like, well, I'm just here because, but now if you have a sense of ownership, you're more likely to perform well. And like you mentioned, positive reinforcement. You know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I think 
it has been proven that when you you give positive feedback and you motivate and you encourage and you say positive things, people are are encouraged to do more good work. Yep. Yep. So yep. for all the leaders that govern with fear and uh, mm-hmm. rule and, and only highlight people or highlight yep. the mistakes, this yep. leader is telling you that's not a good idea. <laughs> so on to the next question. This is an interesting one as well. Hmm. Did you at any time in your career get a role by merit and people felt you were not deserving of that role? If yes, how did you work to change the narrative? I like that. Okay, one. yeah. So yeah, that ha- actually happened twice. So first is the, the, the role as the CEO of the Tony Olumulu Foundation. Um, I found out later once I was in the role, all the people within sort of Tony Olumulu's orbit who felt it was their, they should have had the job. Um, you know, I was a total and complete outsider. I'd never met him before, never even really heard of him before. Um, and, and then came in and did this role and, and, and found out later that there were, you know, all these people had thought it should be for them. So, um, I, I think on that one, because I was running a foundation and I had come from the Rockefeller foundation before that was McKinsey. So I had all the strategy. Um, I think they saw within like two to three weeks that what I was bringing to the table was going to make the whole organization, you know, strong lasting and all that and I mean it's it's 10 years this month now um and 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 all that so I think and and when I later did find out who the people specifically were who wanted the role I then made a point of kind of bringing them into the orbit as advisors and that kind of thing um so that they, they they felt like they were still involved um then the other one actually is this role that I have now in Shell um you know the the Osagi and the other leaders in Shell Nigeria made a conscious choice to get someone from outside shell um, be, because it was a role that needed entrepreneurship, but also needed someone with the kind of social impact experience that they don't always have in shell. Um, and, and so, but again, there were people within the shell system who felt it should have been there. You know, they should have got the job and it shouldn't have gone to an outsider. Um, so similar, similar thing. It was again, just kind of proving um, how by the, the experiences and everything that I brought to the table, how I made all on kind of grow faster and made Shell look good. Um, and, and so that they felt like, okay, now I get, I get why they had to bring in someone from outside. Um, I, I don't, you know, in, in Shell is much bigger. So there may still be people out there that thought it was for them and they, they didn't get it. I don't know. Um, but, but I hope that mm. if they are, that they're, they'll reach out and we can find a way to, to get them involved. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Once again, if you merit something, I mean, I'd rather celebrate you as a, as a colleague and, you know, work hard to merit the next opportunity. So I'm going to power through these questions that have been submitted by our participants on the chat. Mm-hmm. So one of our participants have asked, <laughs> have you given up on getting the Nigerian passport? Should we start an advocacy with regards to that? <laughs> Can, who asked? I who asked that question? Just so I know who asked. Hola, Adebayo. Oh, okay, okay, fine. It's not one of okay. All right. Um, uh, look, it's it, Nigeria is about the hardest country in the world to naturalize in. Um, you know, you, you, it's a sixty. You have to be here for continue continuously for sixteen years. Then um, you have to speak one of the major national languages. You have to prove that you are Nigerian in character, which isn't defined. Um, and then you have to get approval by your local government chair, your traditional ruler, your governor, and then the president. So, you know, when, when Nigerians complain about, oh, how hard it is to become an American or, or someone from the UK, if it, was, if it was reciprocal, um, you know, no Nigerian would ever become American. And, and you know, mm-hmm. Nigeria doesn't give you citizenship by birth. It means nothing. Um, if you're a Nigerian man married to a foreign woman, the foreign woman yeah. can get it. But if you're a Nigerian woman married to a foreign man, he can't. So yeah, also, that's in our constitution, it, guys, by yeah, the way. In the 1999, updated 1999 constitution. As amended, Just yep. 20 years ago, yeah. Um, so it's a very difficult process. But um, look, I'm, I'm 10 years in again. Um, and I, and the, the, the 16 years starts over. Like my 18 years of childhood don't count. So the 16 years had to restart again in 2010. Wow. Um, and, and so now I'm six years out. Um, and then, and then at that point, but, and then apparently, you know, I've talked to people who've gone through it. The DSS gets into your life, um, and checks like every person you've ever met. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really insane. And then, um, I've heard that even when it's discussed in cabinet, um, you know, like it's actually a, a, an agenda item in cabinet. And I just think, doesn't the cabinet have more important things to talk about than the, 
hundred people a year who have asked to become Nigerian. So, yeah. <laughs> gonna leave that. So no, I, ha- I, I haven't, gi- I haven't given up. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm, I mean, you know, it'll happen one day. So wow, I didn't know that it was this difficult. So thank you for shedding light on that. But um, so that being said, everyone, when the ad hoc Senate committee on uh, the constitutional review of the 1999 constitution as amended, when they put out a call for memoranda and you see that clause, you as a citizen, you are able to reply and recommend that that's not right. A woman married to a foreign man, the foreign man is not, but anyway. So on to the next question. So somebody has asked, Yanju Folarin, our former curator of the Lagos Hub has asked, Mm -hmm. apart from studying in a school like Yale, what other leverage do you think made it easy for you to be sought after? Oh, wow. So apart I mean, from I your Ivy League yeah, degree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, again, like I said, I was a, a missionary kid from the middle of Nigeria. Like, I didn't have a network. Um, I mean, I, I guess many of the people, you know, now from that school, you know, we do actually have a strong network now, but um, there, there weren't that many ahead of me that did. Um, so I think other than that, um, like if I had come straight out of Calvin College and then gone into my career, I think it would have been a very different thing. Um, you know, I guess in the end, I still got into McKinsey. I mean, McKinsey obviously added another layer. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I guess the question would have been if if I could, could have gotten to McKinsey straight from going to Calvin instead, I don't know. Um, you know, Dunlady Verheyen did, um, who's who's uh, well known in Lagos. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it, it really was the, the stepping board. I think the other would have been wherever I ended up career-wise, just perform at the highest level and then just get recognized that way. Thank you. I have a, wow, this is quite a detailed question. It's, it's more like um, an experience. Okay, so I have a attendant participant here who says, I was fortunate to attend Hillcrest High School. Weba was more of a classmate. He had just... I had just escaped a war in Liberia. Oh, wow. This was 1990. And when you have a classmate like Weba, he was helpful, accommodating, and made my Nigerian journey quite fruitful. It was not hard to spot the leadership qualities in Weba. He was class president and valedictorian. He was quite involved in a lot of activities, music, sports, and culture. He was popular and admired among cohorts in school. This is quite a recommendation. Wow, wow. <laughs> My question to him is how do you yeah. define leadership as a reflection of your life's journey? Do you believe leaders is an in, leadership is an innate quality or can you shape your character to be a leader? Wow. Okay, so I, I, I know who wrote that. Man Hamzi, thank you for writing that. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so Man, Man came from Liberia um, as, a, as a senior and, you know, obviously it was a traumatic experience. So we, we did our best to help him settle in. And, and Mon, by the way, is, has the, um, he is, his claim to fame is he is the first Lebanese person to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh, wow, so, that's amazing. <laughs> um, that okay, amazing. So, so the question was, um, how do you recognize leadership? And then there was a second how part do you def- How do you define leadership you define? as a reflection of your life's journey? Do you believe leadership is an wow. innate quality or can you shape it nature, nurture? Wow. Okay. Um, I, I don't even know how to answer the first one. Um, I, I guess it's, do, do you leave the environment you're in better than when you found it? Um, there's, there's a lot of people in, I mean, it's very, whatever, that's like a common thing, but there's a lot of people <laughs> that come into, into leadership positions and actually destroy value. Right. And, and that's wow. not a leader, right? Um, it's wow. someone who creates value, whether that's economic value, social value, whatever. So I think that's, that's one thing. Um, and then um, are leaders born or are they, are they can you be made? Um, I think you can see the difference. I mean, cause you can see people who um, have sort of risen up through the ranks, you know, administratively or whatever, and then eventually become the head of their organization. Um, and, and, um, and you sometimes see that, yes, they do, they, do, um, they do know how to manage, they know how to lead it. But the question would be is if you take them out of that environment that they grew up through, would they, would they, and put them in something completely different, would they come out as a leader? And I don't think so. Mm. Um, so I think, I think the people who are leaders are people who can, you know, jump from one thing to the next. And, and, you know, if they're in a completely new group of people within an hour, you know, or even 15 minutes, you, you know, who the, who the leaders are. Um, and I think that's, mm. so I, I think it's something you're born with. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. 
So I have um, another interesting question here, which I'm really looking forward to your response. How soon do you project that we will have 24 hours electricity in Nigeria? <laughs> we all want to know this. Wow, wow. Um, uh, look, I, th look, th there's a lot of things that are, that are being done, th that are the right things are being done right now that I think, you know, we are finally at a point that in the next three to five years, we might be able to achieve that, at least in the cities. Um, not in deeply rural areas. I, I think that's going to be a, a very long, long time. Um, but look, th there's a lot of work obviously going in the off-grid sector that I'm working on. Um, but in the end of the day, you, the scale that you get from the grid, even whether it's a regional grid or national grid, is a much faster way to close that gap. Um, and so, you know, if you look at, you know, the government is pushing really hard to increase tariffs. There's so much pushback, but there, you know, and once that fully goes through, then the, the distribution companies are actually making enough money that they can also invest um, and, 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 and improve their service. You know, Buhari has now mandated that we actually, everybody has to have a meter and they provided capital for that. Um, there's this ambitious plan for 5 million solar connections in the next three to five years and money from the CBN has been put behind that. So there's a, a ongoing, you know, initiatives. And then we're starting to get this sense from the, from the regulators, from the government, you know, officials in charge of this, that maybe we do need to focus less on, on over-regulating power. Um, you know, it, when, when the, uh, the telecoms industry took off, it took off because they were given licenses and then there was regulation, but it was, it was light regulation just to make sure that Nigerian consumers weren't being screwed. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not as if, you know, the, the Nigerian Communications Commission said, you know, you can only charge this much um, you know, per minute or whatever for calls and anything above that is illegal. And then when, when they try to raise that, that people riot, um, you know, and that's what, what you face in the power sector. I mean, it, again, power is a service. You need to pay for the service. Yeah. You need to pay the value of what it costs to deliver it plus a profit. And until we're, we allow that to happen, the whole sector is going to struggle. So, but we're seeing moves in that direction. Um, and I think once it's less regulated, cost reflective tariffs, um, you know, and, and, and then even the gas resources we have are, are unlocked and um, the infrastructure is in place to use it in the country, it, it'll change very quickly. So I, I would say in the cities, with all of those things happening within the next three to five years. Okay, three to five. Is that too long? No, <laughs> as long yeah. as it's within our lifetime, that's... <laughs> yeah, 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 I think it's in our lifetime, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so if you could wave your magic wand and change one thing about Nigeria, just one, what would it be and why? Um, it would be federal character. So- Do tell. Okay, well, the, okay. It's all linked together, but there's, there's um, so, so, you know, if you wanna buy land in Nigeria, um, the, the local, local authority, the, the traditional ruler has to approve it, right? If that local ruler doesn't like you because of what ethnic group you're from, you cannot buy land. And it, it, so that's part of it. The other part of it is um, if I am running for office or being appointed to an office, it is based on where I am indigenous to and not where I am familiar with, right? So we have a national assembly that probably most of the people in the national assembly have spent most of their lives in Lagos. Yet, the people who could actually represent them um, can't represent them because they're not indigenous to that community, right? So like in, in Plateau State, for example, Joss was, was always a very cosmopolitan place, but you can never have it that a, a, a fourth generation Igbo person living in Joss could now run. I mean, yeah. they sort of could, but it just won't happen. And so all of these things are related to federal character is that the land ownership and the and the representation issue, and until that's removed, so that a night so you, so you as a Nigerian are not actually there's nothing actually a Nigerian citizen there's nothing in, other than having a green passport, th there's no other thing that actually makes you a real citizen of Nigeria because you aren't. If you can't freely buy land mm. and represent any place in the country, you are not actually a Nigerian. You are just a citizen of the local government you're from. And until that changes, we will never have a national identity. We will never have national pride. Um, and we will never have people who are 
leading us who have that vision for a great Nigeria. Their vision is always going to be that community that sent them there. Um, and so mm -hmm. all of these things tie together. And I know, you know, I wrote about football and all that. That's the one thing that ties us all together. Nothing else does. And that's not good enough. And so, so, so that's really what needs to change in Nigeria. And it's huge, but, um, and it's really entrenched in culture and history and all that. But if we change that, we could actually completely change Nigeria very quickly. Wow. Wow. Profound. <laughs> Profound um, words. We're going to bring you back for Project Citizen. Just letting you know that. <laughs> We're going to bring okay. you back on because we've got some really important uh, conversations to have surrounding exactly what you just mentioned. So just in the interest of time, I know you've got a football match to watch. Any closing words, final remarks? to our participants, those watching on Zoom, those watching on YouTube? Wow, okay, so I, I, I don't have, I mean, I didn't plan anything, but um, <laughs> it's, look, it's, it's um, this is a great country. Um, we, we have probably more problems than any other country in the world, um, but we also have probably more energy than any other country in the world, and, and we need to harness that. And I think the global shapers in particular, um, you know, you guys are the next generation of leaders. And many of you are already in, in leadership positions way beyond what you should be for your age. Um, but at the same time, you are the same age that our leaders were in 1960. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, those same leaders are still leading us. Um, so you guys need to you know, be ready to step up and be ready to take leadership. But when you do take leadership, just remember these issues of humility, inclusiveness, responsiveness. Don't become an Oga or an Oga at the top because that doesn't <laughs> help anybody, um, you know? And, and so just, you know, take what you're learning and all that, but, but, you know, be aggressive, you know, take your rightful position, but have it with the right mindset and mentality. And then this country can change. Thank you so much. Um, I think, I mean, you said everything. There's, there's really not much more to add to this conversation. I am, so, so, so grateful on behalf of the Global Shapers Community Lagos Hub, Dr. Weva Boer, thank you for honoring this invitation. It's been a great, great uh, conversation with, with you. And if there's anything that I've taken away, I've taken away quite a lot of those values that you shared, integrity, humility, um, honesty, transparency well, to being a leader. And those are what make you a leader as well. So thank you everyone for joining. My name is Chinea Monday Adimihe. This is the Global Shapers Community Lagos Hub. Please follow us on social media, Instagram at Lagos Shapers and Twitter at Lagos Shapers. We'd love to hear from you and tweet out all of Dr. Boa's amazing uh, quotes and see you at the next one. Have a lovely evening, everyone. <laughs>